Good morning and welcome to our February 21st uh, worship service, which is a virtual only service uh, this week. It is the first Sunday in Lent. Um, thank you for joining us either on Facebook or listening over the phone. Um, I uh, appreciate your, your patience as we are navigating a situation where we cannot be in person this week, uh, but plan is for the 28th to be back where how we normally are with our drive-up services. Um, one other thing I'd like to note, um, next week, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, we have scheduled uh, in-person prayer workshops. Uh, the in-person prayer workshops will be canceled for this coming week, um, but the Zoom ones will still be available, and you can find more information on that uh, on our Facebook pages. So, um, but again, after this week, things should go back to normal or what has been normal. Um, so I'd like to begin uh, with our first scripture reading uh, from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out to the ark, I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18-22. through 22. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Finally, our third reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, Verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit des descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. If you would join me in an attitude of prayer. Loving God, we work to follow the journey of Jesus in his ministry. 
looking forward to the great revelation of your power and love shown to us on Easter morning. Help us during these 40 days to not only focus on our relationship with you, but also to grow as we examine the good news we find in the scriptures for this season. We pray that through reading and learning about these messages of good news, we might grow in our relationship with you, as well as our love for you and one another. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place, be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning to you all. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the first Sunday in Lent, and we are beginning a new sermon series for the Lenten season called Good News in Challenging Times. I thought it might be helpful to take a few minutes to go over just what the season of Lent is all about. I know it's not the first Lent that most of you will be experiencing, but I find it helpful sometimes to clarify the meaning and purpose of different church seasons. Some pastors will focus on different parts of a particular season. Some may not focus on them at all. And if you grew up in or are coming from a different faith tradition, you may have a different understanding of what Lent is all about, or maybe none at all. So here we go. Lent is a season in the church of 40 days, not counting Sundays, that begins on Ash Wednesday, and it ends on the Saturday before Easter Sunday, which is sometimes called Holy Saturday. The reason that the Sundays are not counted in the 40 days is because they are meant to represent um, a mini Easter, if you will. Um, according to the United Methodist Church website, Lent comes from the Anglo-Saxon word lengthen, excuse me, uh, meaning lengthen, and refers to the lengthening days of spring. These 40 days we recognize are meant to represent the time that Jesus spends in the wilderness, including the time he endured the temptation of Satan, as well as the time that he was preparing to begin his ministry on earth. For United Methodists and many other Christian denominations, Lent is a time of repentance, fasting, and the preparation for the coming of Easter. You can kind of think of it in the same way that Advent is the time of preparation and expectation for the coming of Christmas. Now, historically, Lent started as a period of fasting and preparation for baptism by people who were converting to Christianity um, as they were typically baptized on Easter Sunday. Now, in today's world, Christians typically will use this season to focus on their relationship with God, uh, working to grow as disciples and extending themselves. Part of that process for many includes giving something up or finding a new way to give of themselves for others, like volunteering. And you may notice over these coming weeks that the liturgical readings during Lent, until we reach Palm Sunday, will focus primarily on the meaning of baptism and discipleship, which really aligns with the season's original purpose. So congratulations. You have all completed your introduction to the season of Lent course as offered through your local United Methodist Church. Your completion of this course will be noted in your official file and your certificates of completion will be mailed out in four to eight weeks. Just kidding. Um, there is no official file on each of you and there are no certificates. But I do hope that this short little primer will be helpful as we worship during the season as well as in your daily lives during the season. Now after spending time in prayer and study, I found that while the liturgical scripture selections for year A and C of the Revised Common Lectionary are rather sober and demanding, the selections for year B that we are currently in are basically about good news. And I feel that using this season to look at some of the good news we find in the liturgical scripture selections will help us to continue to navigate some challenging times, including the pandemic, the political climate of our na uh, nation, and some of the other ongoing challenges that we find within our own denomination. So this week, our first message of our new sermon series is titled, Some Good News. So let's begin with our first reading from today, from the book of Genesis, chapter 9. Now this one is easy to find some good news in. 
even though this is following the flood narrative when God chose to destroy much of the world, saving only Noah's family and the animals as outlined in the story, good news does follow. In fact, you can make the argument that the entire passage is itself good news. Right from the beginning of this section of scripture, God says, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now I would say that's extremely good news. God promises not to flood the world again, taking everything back to square one. And to add to this promise, God says, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So not only does, the, uh, does God promise to never have this massive flood that wiped out most of the living creatures on earth, um, but we also got the rainbow out of the deal, too. Now, personally, I like rainbows. I think they're beautiful, and when I see them, I think not just about how beautiful they are, but I'm also reminded of God's promise and covenant that it symbolizes. So, this one's not too challenging, I think, to find the good news in. Let's go on to our second reading now uh, from today, from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3. I think, just like with our passage from Genesis, here we can find in the very first sentence some good news. For Christ suffered for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. Right here we have the literal good news of God's saving grace through Jesus Christ. The news doesn't get much better than that. But wait, there's more, just like on the infomercials. If we go to the second half of the passage we find more good news, and it's about baptism in this case. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. So right here, we have the promise of salvation um, again, and all the benefit, everything, you know, with baptism. It is, this passage is full of good news. We have the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the good news of baptism. And when we think about it, it makes sense that we would find an abundance of good news in a book like First Peter, because the book, the in this book, the author was addressing it to the elect resident aliens um, who were spread throughout uh, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and uh, Phinthia. This was written to those who were new to the Christian faith. So these kinds of messages would not only help them learn more about the faith, but also instill some hope in them for their salvation in future. Now, for our last reading from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, this passage is broken into three different sections. We have the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, and the beginning of the Galilean ministry. Each of these sections contains good news, both for early readers as well as for modern readers like us today. The baptism of Jesus contains the acknowledgement from God that Jesus is God's son. A voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This acknowledgement brings legitimacy to who Jesus was and what Jesus was. Jesus was not just some prophet or random person uh, wandering around claiming some falsehood. Right here, God claims Jesus as God's son and mentions that God is pleased with Jesus. So Jesus must have been on the right track, must have been doing the right things. Now, the temptation of Jesus, the second section, focuses on when Jesus went out into the wilderness for 40 days and is tempted by Satan. Now, this version of the story is much shorter and has less details than some of the other Gospels that go into 
exactly how Satan tempted Jesus, um, but it still contains the important part of the story. Jesus is tempted but does not fall to Satan's temptation. Jesus stands true to who and what he is. One could argue that this gives further legitimacy to Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, because whom else could withstand so many temptations and such powerful ones as we hear about in the other Gospels? And then we get to the third section, the beginning of the Galilean ministry. Right away in the second half of verse 14, the first verse in this section, we are told that Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Well, just what is this good news? Well, we are told that Jesus said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. This is what people had been wanting and waiting for. And they had been wanting and waiting for a long time. This is good news. Now, we do have to acknowledge that the people didn't really understand what this all meant. So while this is good news, it might not have played out the way that some of them were expecting, or many of them might have been expecting. Many of the people in that time thought the Messiah would come with an army and overthrow the Romans. They thought the Messiah would restore the people of Israel to power and prominence. But that's not exactly what happened, as we well know. This is still good news, though. So here we are in Lent, a time for reflection and growth. Here we are in a pandemic, a time of fear and illness. But even in challenging times, we can still find the good news. When I was in seminary, my uh, preaching professor taught us to always look for the good news in Scripture uh, when we were preaching, because if we didn't, if we weren't bringing the good news to our people at some level, we would leave people wanting and empty of the good news. And that's a big part of our faith, if not the, like the primary part of our faith. And I have always tried to follow that, not just in preaching, but also in life. Some of you may have heard me say um, at, from one time or another that I'm the eternal optimist. Um, and I do make a hard effort in living into that. Sometimes finding the good news in life and in scripture is harder than others. But I try to rely on my faith in God's grace, and I still work to find it. It is my sincerest hope that during this season of Lent, throughout our time together in worship and, and other times we may be together, that you might find, hear, and see the good news. Often during Lent, people will give something up, as I mentioned before, but, but maybe this year we could try to add something. Maybe this year we could try to look for the good news and God's love and grace not just in scripture, but everywhere in life. Some days will be harder than others. I believe me, I get that. But I think the rewards of the efforts are far more worth it in the attempt. So I pray that this season of Lent may be one of growth, love, mercy, and grace for you. May you hear the good news and let it build you up, strengthen you, bring you joy, and be a light to the world. We are all struggling right now. Hopefully, as we experience the good news ourselves, we can share it with others and help bring some light into the darkness that we may find ourselves in. I pray this for all of you, for myself, and for the whole world. Amen. I would like to invite you again to an attitude of prayer. Holy God, we come before you this morning, a thankful people for the many blessings you bestow upon us. You have taught us to bring everything to you in prayer, both our joys and celebrations, as well as the things that weigh heavily upon our hearts. This morning, we are lifting up prayers for those who are suffering, whether physically, emotionally, or mentally. God, we lift them into your healing hands and pray that you would watch over them. We also ask that you would continue to guide the hands and the efforts 
of all those who work in the medical field, including our doctors and nurses and surgeons and research scientists and lab technicians and so many others who are working so hard to help us to be healthy and well. God, we also lift to you those who work so hard to keep us safe in this world. We lift up our servicemen and women serving in the military, our police and firefighters, our first responders, and so many others. God, we ask that you would guide them in their hearts and their minds, in their words and their actions. We ask that you would watch over them and keep them safe and strong. And God, for those who are serving in faraway places, we pray that they may be able to return home soon, that we could begin to see an end to conflict in our world. Lord, we also lift up our nation and every nation in the world. We ask for your intervention with this pandemic. We ask for your peace to help settle the unrest and anger and controversy and conspiracy and hatred. Help us to work alongside you to be agents of your peace and love and grace and mercy. Help us to see the truth that you see, that we are all your children, equal of being and worthy of love and mercy and grace. Help us to find ways to come together, even in this time of social distancing and needing to be physically apart, but help us to find ways to come together in prayer, in our praise, and in showing love not only to you, but to one another. All of these things, as well as those we keep quietly upon our own hearts and minds, we lift you this day in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, I want to thank you again for joining me this morning. Um, again, the plan is to be back to our normal drive-in uh, access on the 28th, um, but if anything uh, looks to be needing to change that or affect that, you will be notified uh, via email or phone call uh, as soon as that information is available. I pray that you are all safe and healthy, and I miss you all very much. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Have a blessed day. And now as Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness, so we will spend 40 days in the season of Lent. Consider, children of the covenant, the faithfulness of God and what it means to be baptized into Christ. Live each day proclaiming the good news in word and deed that God is with us and the kingdom is near. May the God of covenant faithfulness enfold you, the beloved Son encourage you, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you in blessing this day and forever. Amen. Go in peace.